You know how I said in the last episode that I noticed it's been a while since we've had a shuttle crash? It would appear somebody was taking note. Chakotay and Seven are flying over a forest, and after bouncing off a shield of some kind, have a bit of an oopsie. Seven manages to poop yellow to open the shield and get through. Well, sort of. The shuttle doesn't make it, but they manage to teleport onto the surface, so that's a start. Chakotay took a knock in the process, though, and his leg's leaking raspberry sauce, so here's hoping that case has a medkit in it. It'd be embarrassing to die of septic shock because he accidentally grabbed the one with his laundry in. Speaking of shit pilots, let's catch up with Paris. He's tearing around a space station with no consideration for other ships because Tom Paris is, occasionally, still a dick. He's chosen the wrong place to indulge his boy racer streak, though, as he's called by the authorities and told it'll be reported to his commanding officer. The punishment, according to Janeway, is a course on how to not fly like a complete wanker. I think three days is a touch optimistic, but at least it'll give Balana a break. Seven and Chicote are looking for shuttle debris in the hopes of making a transmitter. With a bit of luck, it might even get through the shield. There are a few wrinkles, though. The first is what looks like a native community, one without significant technology. That's a bit odd, given that we came to this planet to attend a conference held by the technologically advanced species that lives here, and the natives we found seem to share a similar evolutionary ancestor, too. The second wrinkle is Chicote's leg. It's becoming infected on top of the cut and hairline fracture, so he's going to stay behind while Seven looks for more debris. Her search is a success, but we've got a third wrinkle now. Chicote's been discovered, and they react to seeing a strange, shiny thing with a voice coming out of it by twatting it with a rock, which I think is fair enough under the circumstances. Unable to contact him, she instead puts the debris in the empty case, raising some interesting questions about why Chicote grabbed it in the middle of a crash, and sets off to where we left him. Despite the rock twatting, we discover these people are actually quite friendly. That's what Seven learns when she manages to track down Chicote and finds him in a cave receiving medical treatment. That's the Prime Directive, buggered, but at least it's not his fault. That doesn't mean he can't take advantage of it, though, clearly reveling in his chance to study anthropology up close. Seven's not chuffed, but what choice do they have? Might as well stay here and rest. As the others are preparing for some shore leave and Paris is meeting his piloting instructor, Chicote is learning the local language. A point to the writers here for giving them what seems to be an entirely non-verbal lexicon. Seven returns as Chicote is trading his rank badge for something that resembles a piece of flint. Given how little screen time that rank badge has entitled him to for the last six years, he's probably better off with the rock. Learning the language wasn't entirely for shits and giggles, as he's also been able to determine a crude map. Seven tells him she thinks she can hook up the debris she found to another chunk she detected a few kilometres away, so buggers off to do that. The plan immediately turns to shit when she falls on her face and loses her tricorder. So much for limiting cultural contamination, though you could argue the blame ultimately lies with the doctor for prescribing those fucking high heels three years ago. She's not alone on the buggering things up front. Chicote, now with a walking stick, joins a group and sees that they're mimicking his tattoo. From the look on his face, he started to realise the impact of his presence. As the day draws to a close and we hear and see the start of a storm, Seven's perhaps wishing she paid more attention to Chicote's shit map. I'm not quite sure how you lose your direction when one of the points of reference is a fucking mountain, but maybe the canopy is thicker here than everywhere else we've been shown. Either way, she's managed it and circled back to where she lost her tricorder. As she succumbs to either despair or a desire for sleep, a kid who'd taken an interest in her a couple of times back at the camp appears, and she's come bearing both a blanket and the knowledge of how to start a fire. I suspect Seven won't be letting Chicote know that he was right to suggest taking a guide. Paris's tutor is pointing out all of the flaws with the Delta Flyer Junior's cockpit, giving Paris a chance to blame those for his shit piloting. That might have been a good plan if the assessor hadn't already looked at the records and knows Paris is the dick who designed the controls. Every time Paris pushes to speed things up, he pushes back twice as hard to slow it down and smiles while doing it. I'm starting to like this guy. Down on the planet, Seven's waking to a new day. The kid's still here, and this time Seven accepts food before redrawing Chicote's shit map in the dirt and asking the girl for directions. She knows where Seven wants to go, and is willing to take her too, but that's a double-edged sword. The kid might know the destination, but she also wants to show Seven some pretty things on the way, and take the time to fully appreciate them too.
Back at the camp, Chicote's getting a bit antsy about Seven, and asks the guy he traded with earlier if he's seen her. There might be some crossed wires, as he instead brings another woman wearing a piece of the shuttle on her face to emulate Seven. Still, that's a start, so he instead asks them where they found the debris. He needn't have worried. Seven's made it to the shuttle fragment she wanted, albeit with help, and makes a start on trying to contact Voyager. Speaking of Voyager, they've realised shit's gone south. Chicote's missed a scheduled report, and the conference they were supposed to be going to says they never arrived. They've also spotted a bit of the shuttle resting on the shield that caused the crash. I suppose we could ask why they didn't just land on the shield instead of shooting through it then, but let's ignore that for now. Regardless, the shield is stopping them from scanning. Looking for debris or survivors with their eyes is an option, what with the shield being transparent and all, but nobody seems to consider this, so we don't do it. Instead, we'll ask the species on the planet that we know about, the ones who are holding the conference. The ambassador we speak to clears up some questions. They know all about the shield, and would have warned Chicote if he hadn't said he was taking a different route. I guess this is what you get for sightseeing without letting anybody know. The ambassador also knows about the tribe, as they're the reason the shield exists. It seems his people used to be assholes who exploited indigenous tribes until some aliens turned up and slapped a shield over them. Their attitude might have improved a bit in the time since, but the shield still remains a mystery to them, meaning the ambassador simply isn't capable of lowering it. Still, the impossible never stopped us before, so we'll have a go at it. We've grabbed the shuttle fragment, and damage to it lets us know that Seven's pooping was able to lower the shield. It also lets us know what went wrong. The shield pulled an Uno reverse card on all that pooping, which is what destroyed the shuttle and left the damage we've learned from. Voyager can try doing the same, but risks a similar result. Seven's ready to try calling Voyager. The attempt goes somewhat awry when lightning shoots from the gizmo and hits a rock, a fact that might be connected with these particular rocks being magnetic, as shown by the kid playing with them. Chicote turns up, having clearly made pretty good time over six kilometres with his broken and infected leg. Maybe the splint wraps packed with something that got him tripping balls so he can't feel the pain. It may have been a wasted trip. The magnetic shite here will prevent a signal, but using Chicote's tricorder, Seven finds a spot nearly five kilometres away where she might be able to open the shield enough to get a message through. Slight problem, the nose of the shuttle weighs half a metric ton, so dragging it several kilometres isn't an option, even for someone with borgmentations. She suggests involving the natives, an idea that Chicote is now against after seeing how much our presence has influenced them. Still, staying here with all this debris might be an even worse option, so getting themselves and their tech out might be worth asking for their help. A bit of dragging later, and Seven declares that we've reached the right spot, telling everybody to get back while she fiddles with gizmos. She's not the only one doing a science, though this one's more Janeway's kind. Voyager poops some yellow at the shield, and the shield poops right back using the same beam. Well, this isn't working, so Tuvok suggests we upgrade to fireworks instead. That shouldn't give any feedback, though I imagine the technologically advanced species on the planet might have something to say about us detonating antimatter warheads in their back garden. It's academic anyway, as Seven started lowering the shield from within. The kid with the magnetic rock collection wants a closer look despite Seven's warnings, and gets an Emperor Palpatine special for her trouble. At least we're able to talk to Voyager now, and we update them on everything. Chicote can go back to the ship while Seven treats the kid with a med kit we send down, meaning the natives just watched one man vanish and Seven use a magical box that appeared from nowhere to heal someone. We are really fucking bad at this non-interference thing. <laughs> The doc's quite complimentary of how well Chicote's leg was treated, here's hoping we can heal the damage we've done just as effectively. As they make preparations for removing all of the tech we left down there, Seven is watching the electrocuted kid wake up. She's no worse off for the experience, it seems, so it's time for us to scarp her. She's about to leave after receiving the gift of a blanket from the kid when she hears voices. That's a bit curious when these people are non-verbal, and the answer is because it's not them. It's an expedition from the other species on the planet. Now the shield's down, they want to make a full survey of the area to see what's worth researching, extracting, or otherwise fucking about with. Don't worry though, those natives are going to be even happier than they were before, as they'll be made civilised in the process. Congratulations, Seven. You've let the British in. Back up to Voyager we go, where Chicote is arguing that we need to put that shield back as soon as possible to stop what's happening. 
After a bit of debate, even Seven agrees that not doing so would be destroying a unique culture. The Ambassador doesn't see things quite the same way, and argues that we have no right to teleport Seven's gizmo back aboard and restore the shield. Janeway's got Starfleet regulations on her side this time though, as we're not allowed to share tech, and that's definitely a rule that we never ever break. The Ambassador's clearly not impressed. That might explain why, as we're teleporting the debris on board later, we come under attack from one of his ships and he tells us to piss off before we can fix the shield 7 disabled. Janeway complies, though only because our teleporters are buggered and she has another idea. Paris is on his piloting test in the Delta Flyer Junior when he receives a call from Janeway. The tutor's not delighted when he puts his foot down and heads for the planet, and even less so when they start to get shot at. Voyager steps in to stop the argument with our usual approach to diplomacy, and the other ship runs the fuck away. We're feeling generous enough to not lead the expedition inside the shield when we restore it at least. Paris teleports them aboard the Delta Flyer Junior and sticks them behind a force field, just in case any of them fancy getting handsy. Unfortunately, he's under attack again and they've buggered his teleporter up. That means we can't grab Seven's gizmo and restore the shield, but this is Paris, so he just kabooms it instead. I do hope nobody was in the blast radius. Voyagers departed the planet, though we're not told if that was after dropping off the people that Paris held. Maybe they're safe, maybe we spaced them, maybe Neelix will be serving mystery meat for a week. Chakotay and Seven are having a chat down in the cargo bay she calls home because she still doesn't have quarters, despite Lieutenant Brokennose's old room going spare now. A discussion about what happened on the planet leads to concern over whether the expedition managed to scan Seven's gizmo before Paris kaboomed it, and we leave them to wonder if they just helped destroy the native community's way of life as we fly away. And so the Voyager crew leave their stain on yet another culture. To be fair, this one wasn't entirely their fault, though Chakotay was willing to ignore the potential for problems until it was, in a very real and literal sense, staring him right in the face. Another reminder of why the Prime Directive exists to begin with, and a hint of the ripples we've left behind after the credits roll on an episode. I wonder how great a portion of the Delta Quadrant suffers from our civilization. And we weren't even the main bastards of the week, that task falling to the technologically advanced species of this world. I imagine there are those watching who felt their immediate about-face on being regretful of their past actions was too abrupt, but I personally rather liked it. As a warning of how thin the veneer of enlightenment can be, it was very effective indeed. While we're handing out compliments, we'll again mention what a good choice it was for the native culture to be entirely non-verbal. We've had the conversation about aliens regularly just being a carbon copy of us with a different nose before, so such a fundamental shift is refreshing. Having a form of sign language be the standard could also be considered a good, if likely unintentional, nod to inclusion. It's not all positive though. While watching this one, you could have been forgiven for feeling a sense of déjà vu. That's because we've already had an episode that ran along very similar lines, at least in regards to Chakotay and Seven's actions. Comparing one small step from Season 6 with this gives us a pretty close checklist. A culturally significant find, Chakotay's interest swaying his actions with negative results, friction between he and Seven as a result, an injury largely sidelines him, Seven being initially dismissive before learning the value of the experience. I'm all for stories where Seven gets to grow, but just as in one small step, it feels like this came at the expense of a chance to see something more of Voyager's second most underused character. Those parallels detract from an otherwise mostly solid premise, albeit one that's not going to win any awards for originality. Seeing how spacefaring species shit on the lives of others isn't exactly new, but at least this one shows us that we're capable of understanding why that's bad. End of episode. Did we visit Sick Bear before? Feels like this background has been used. I don't know, and the guy who makes these is too lazy to check. Anyway, let's get on with it. You know, I'm usually on board with hijinks, but I don't know if I've got it in me. Literally. I think I've emptied myself with those last three dumps. Maybe I should offer to use some of the feces I store in the teleport buffer. You should offer to do what with the what now? Wait, did I say that out loud? Why have you got my shit stored in a teleport buffer? No reason. Uh, you know what, I reckon we might leave that conversation there. Woof. <laughs>